Hello, and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Paul Rosen, and I am the executive chairman of Global Go. I have been an entrepreneur and an executive in the regulated cannabis industry since 2012, and I have been a cannabis enthusiast myself since 1978. I am shocked, awed, and delighted by how quickly the cannabis industry has transitioned itself from a basement industry mired in controversy to a global concern transforming the health and wellness of hundreds of millions of patients and citizens across the planet, while also providing a much needed economic boost to regional economies all over the world. I started my first cannabis company back in the dark days of 2012, which I then took public on the Toronto Stock Exchange two years later. In 2018, this company became the first cannabis company ever to list its shares on the NASDAQ exchange, and it became a unicorn. Any preconceptions I may have harbored about what outcomes may be possible in cannabis were shattered by that experience. It is incumbent upon all of us to dream as large as possible in order for our industry to deliver on its massive potential. Today's webinar topic is the Africa Cannabis Journey. The African cannabis industry has exploded in recent years, led first by Lesotho, the first African country to introduce a legal cannabis industry, but followed quickly by several African countries, including Zimbabwe, South Africa, Malawi, Zambia, Ghana, and Uganda, who have each taken their own steps to set up legal cannabis markets. However, it's fair to say that as the global cannabis industry has experienced strategic, operational, and capital challenges, the ripple effects have been felt throughout the continent. Today's webinar will focus on the African cannabis journey to date and how in such uncertain times, the continent can fully unlock the health, industrial, and developmental potential of this transformative plant. In that vein, I am so delighted today to formally announce the launch of Global Go Africa a strategic partnership between Global Go and the Africa Cannabis Advisory Group, ACA for short, to service the developing African cannabis industry. The ACA group has been a pioneer in Africa's growing cannabis industry, offering consulting, business development, capital raising, technology solutions, marketing, brand development, and recruiting and compliance services for the African cannabis sector. With this strategic partnership, ACA will now work alongside Global Go to expand the range of services provided for the African cannabis market. The strategic partnership will leverage Global Go's international reach, its broad industry experience, its in-depth industry knowledge, and strong industry position within North America, alongside ACA's extensive experience on the African continent to offer leading industry services. This partnership will facilitate the expansion of cannabis hemp companies within Africa, as well as cannabis hemp investments and product exports across borders between Africa, Europe, and North America. The strategic partnership will operate under the banner of Global Go Africa with shared office space in Johannesburg. The ACA team brings a depth of experience, advocacy, and business acumen in a highly regulated industry. And at Global Go, we could not be more excited about the creation of this transformative alliance between our two firms. Okay, now let's get to our incredible program today. To kick things off, I am honored, humbled, and absolutely thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Myrtle Clark. Myrtle is the Managing Director of Fields of Green for All, and she is one of the world's most influential cannabis activists. In 2010, Myrtle and her late partner, Julian Stobbs, were arrested in their home in South Africa on charges of possession and dealing in cannabis. They were so indig indignant that they did something truly heroic. They sued the government on charges of enacting unlawful laws. As full-time drug policy activists, they have traveled both nationally and internationally in order to give a voice to civil society's concerns around drug policy reform. In 2013, they established their not-for-profit Fields of Green for All to promote the legal regulation of cannabis in South Africa, working to ensure that all citizens share the benefits of legally regulated cannabis by guiding individuals and communities 
who had been historically marginalized by use, cultivation, and trading cannabis. Julian and Myrtle worked tire tirelessly to raise awareness about the plant and its potential in order to create an open industry benefiting all South Africans. The devastating loss of Jules Stubbs to an act of senseless violence during a house robbery a few weeks ago has impacted every corner of the cannabis community, both in South Africa and across the world. And the entire cannabis community mourns the passing of this fearless warrior who dedicated his life fighting for freedom and fields of green for all. In lieu of a webinar registration fee, we are encouraging each attendee at today's webinar to make a donation to Fields of Green for All. There's a link provided on your screen. We are so proud to support this organization and I hope you will as well. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Myrtle Clark. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction and for inviting me here um, to be the voice of your conscience, because um, that is my role as a civil society activist here in South Africa. And I'd like to stress right from the beginning that the African cannabis industry is 700 years old. And this is something that I would like you to remember throughout of this webinar. The African cannabis industry is nothing new. It is something that is entrenched. It is endemic. Ever since the um, Arab traders first brought their seeds to our coasts, we have been trading, using, cultivating, and processing cannabis here in Africa. So that is why I call myself the voice of your conscience, because it is an uphill battle for us as civil society to be heard. And many people say that, oh, you know, we just have to educate the public because there's such a stigma surrounding cannabis. But I'd say we've done that. I'd say that all over Africa, people speak about cannabis. We've got our advocates, we've got our lobbyists, we've got our people who use cannabis and advocate for it. What we need to do now is actually educate the lawmakers because there's a huge gap. One just has to look at the recently uh, private purposes bill that was put uh, before parliament here in South Africa. And you will just see there clearly in black and white that our lawmakers do not know about this plant. And I think as civil society, we need a really strong partnership with those people who have got the money, who have got the expertise. Those people are saying, oh, we're going to create the African cannabis industry. No, you're not. You're going to help us legitimize the African cannabis industry. So, we have, as you said, we've been working for the last 10 years. It's on the 5th of August. It was 10 years since Julian and myself were arrested in, um, in our home. And uh, just to create a bit of reality around this, um, the police arrived in 2010 on that August morning at two o'clock in the morning. And they went and, uh, and they uh, bashed down our kitchen door in order to arrest us for this plant. And I can tell you that the robbers who murdered Julian also came to our house at two o'clock in the morning. So my next point over and above educating the lawmakers is to stress that we want the South African police service and cannabis to re be removed as far as possible from each other. Because we have um, an arrest helpline here at, um, at Fields of Green for All, which operates 24 hours a day and has been going since 2011. Although since the constitutional uh, judgment of 2018, we've seen a drastic reduction in, um, in cannabis arrests, but we still have arrests every single day. The arrests are tied up in corruption. A lot of the time the police just steal the stock and the case never goes to court. So what we really need to, as cannabis business people, as people who understand the 700-year-old year African cannabis industry, is we need your help to establish a cannabis ombudsman, to establish something that is the go-between between the, the public who use, trade, and cultivate cannabis and 
the South African police. An ombudsman that, mo that moderates the situation, that establishes where the harm has been done, where the one human being has harmed another human being by their cannabis use, cultivation, or trade. And if harm has been done, then yes, for sure, hand it over to the South African police. This is a very, very important partnership. It's something that we can't do on our own. It's something that is going to take money to set up. And it's something that is really very, very, very important. Before anybody buys any cannabis stocks, before anybody speaks about the gazillions and millions that are going to be made by the African cannabis industry, we have to stop the police. This is very, very important. And in order to do this, we have, um, we've uh, been writing for the last almost six years, a manifesto, a manifesto for regulation. And you'll find this manifesto, you'll find it on our, on our website. There's a PDF or you can, you can um, order a hard copy of the final draft. The final final is going to come out by the end of this year. And this manifesto outlines what is needed in order to create social equity in cannabis in South Africa. Obviously our, our dream of the cannabis ombudsman and getting rid of the police is in there. But in there is everything that is needed in order to legitimize the existing cannabis industry. Because right now, I can assure you that the guy who sells the matchbox of weed at the gas station on the corner is not going to have any part in the so-called new cannabis industry. And as Julian and I have been saying hundreds of thousands of times over the last 10 years, if there isn't some way for the guy who is selling the matchbox of weed on the corner to be absorbed into the legitimate cannabis industry in South Africa and put food on the table and keep the wolf from the door, then cannabis is not legal and our job is not done. So that is another way in which commercial cannabis people who have all this experience and all this expertise and all this money can help to absorb these people who are marginalized. The farmers down in Pondo land who are sprayed by glyphosate, who are still pro having problems with their soil quality, who are still being arrested by the police when they're trying trying to get their produce to their markets. So this is where we need your help. We really need your help is to look after the marginalized people. And we're not talking about jobs. We don't want jobs. We want empowerment. We want empowerment so that we can be part of the conversation. And right now, the people who have got the money have got the ear of the government. Our government loves bright, shiny things, bright, shiny things and making promises. You know, our government promises, promised houses to everybody in 1994. South Africa is exhausted. We're upset. We're traumatized. And every single web webinar that I attend, the first thing people say, oh, it's going to be worth 750 billion. No, it's not. Stop overselling it to us because South Africa is tired of broken promises. And the guy with the matchbox, I'll keep coming back to him. I'll keep coming back to him. He's not going to see any of that. He might get a job at minimum wage. So that is really our mission. And a way that we have devised and that we have been inspired by European activists to do this and to start by doing this right now is to establish cannabis social clubs because we already have our privacy judgment. Uh, although the privacy, the, the privacy judgment bill uh, leaves a lot to question, I can tell people that there are already 40 or 50 cannabis social clubs operating, maybe on the fringes of the law, but the cannabis social club, and we call them Dacha private clubs because we love calling cannabis Dacha, that's our word. Um, our Dacha private clubs need assistance. They need assistance to be the best that they can be. And a Dacha private club can be opened in a shack, in a squatter camp, or it can be opened up in an upmarket area. It is one model that can, it's, it's one size fits all, and it's a start. And if, if, we don't if we don't close that gap between 
GMP, IOS, SBT, whatever, whatever, regulations and quality control and, and this license and that license and you've got to comply with this, that and the other. If we don't catch a close, that's very necessary. If we don't close the gap between that and the guy who sells the matchbox, I'm afraid I'm going to be fighting until I'm very, very old. So this is what we are looking for as civil society. We're looking for a partnership. We're looking for you not to oversell it, not to oversell it, listen to me. We do not have a utopian vision here at Fields of Green. We have a vision that deals with the police. We have the vision of uh, the, the people at heart who use cannabis to put food on the table, not stocks and shares and money in the bank. I'm talking loaves of bread. I'm talking school shoes. So let's carry on talking i'm very inspired by by the big commercial aspect of of cannabis i think it, the potential is awesome but i have to exercise caution and so i thank you very very much for inviting me to be a guest speaker here to be the voice of your conscience and i really look forward to us all working together to create this balance and i'm really looking forward to the presentation by Sally Kiba from Lesotho, um, because I think that she will echo what I say. And I'm looking forward to what, what Sibs has to say about the South African National Cannabis Survey, because that's another tool that we can use to close the gap. So I'm looking forward to sitting on the sidelines, um, uh, uh, participating in the chat. And um, thanks very much. It's lovely to connect with everybody around the world. Bye -bye. <laughs> wow, Myrtle, that was an incredibly inspiring and quite frankly, an urgently important message. This is the type of leadership that our industry needs. I'll say from my experience in Canada that we could have done better. We tended to turn it into big business and we forgot about the tireless advocates that had contributed even their liberty in pursuit of a plant that we're all celebrating and planning, you know, our next big uh, commercial enterprise. So the best cannabis economies are the ones where we don't try to obliterate the unregulated market. It's where we vend it in and invite participants from the old unregulated market to participate in the new regulated market in order to achieve all of the lofty ambitions we have for this plant. Murad, on behalf of the entire global cannabis industry, we thank you sincerely for your incredibly important advocacy work that will continue to profoundly improve the health and the welfare of communities across Africa and in fact the world. Thank you. I'm so pleased now to bring our partner, Sib Zaba, the co-founder of African Cannabis Advisory, to analyze and discuss the recent South African Social Surveys Institute nationwide survey. Social Survey Institute is working on a comprehensive survey to better understand the profile of cannabis users, growers, investors, and other key stakeholders in the industry to better inform policy development. Global Go and ACA are proud to support this important initiative and the findings of the survey will actually be a topic for a follow-up webinar in December. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sibs Zaba. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, appreciate that, uh, that introduction. And to everyone joining us from uh, South Africa, um, Europe, US, and other parts of the world, um, welcome to our webinar, uh, our first webinar, Africa uh, webinar today. Um, we are really uh, honored to have you all uh, with, join us today. And um, we are very, very excited about what is only the beginning of uh, what promises to be a very long, fulfilling uh, journey as the cannabis industry grows and develops over the next, uh, next few decades. But uh, I think we all have quite an important role uh, to play in what the story looks like. Us at uh, ACA Group have been in the uh, industry uh, for sort of 12 months formally and, and roughly 18 months uh, in terms of uh, a little bit of a research period before that. Um, I wanted to briefly uh, touch on uh, and expand, uh, I wanted to expand on this uh, social surveys cannabis uh, initiative, which, which uh, Myrtle touched on and Paul touched on. And um, just to you know, uh, emphasize and, and sort of unpack that a little bit, Social Surveys Institute is a South African NGO that has been involved in um, bringing forth very important social issues 
um, via in-depth research projects, so, you know, so everything from HIV, uh, AIDS to uh, education, a lot of social surveys work has been used to drive uh, and influence policy uh, formulation and decisions. Um, when we came across the, um, the Institute, um, they had been looking for um, a way to uh, expand on what the, uh, the African or South African cannabis industry looked like. The key thing that the, the survey is trying to solve for is for real and reliable data. So one of the big issues in the industry today is that we just don't know what the industry looks like at a granular level. This makes it very challenging for uh, investors, entrepreneurs, governments to make decisions that are for the best interest of, uh, of, of the industry long term. And so we are, um, ourselves and Global Go are sponsoring the first phase of this uh, survey, which is looking to um, have a minimum of 5,000 participants. Um, we've already started, and as, and as Paul mentioned, we've uh, reached 2,000 uh, participants to date. With your help uh, and uh, with uh, um, much more effort over the next couple of weeks and months, we think that uh, by the time we get to December, we, we, we'll have our next webinar uh, we'll be able, able to um, uh, to showcase some of the findings from uh, from the great work that social institute uh, social surveys institute is doing in this space. Um, and now I would like to move on to introducing our keynote uh, speaker for today, um, which is uh, Daphne Fafudi. Um, Daphne is the um, medical controls officer at SOPRA. Um, she, which is, for those of you who are international and, and may not be familiar, SOPRA is the South African Health uh, Products Regulatory Authority. They oversee um, uh, the cannabis uh, as, as it stands, but there are discussions about uh, how that might change. Um, Daphne is probably one of the most, most sought out and popular people in uh, the South African cannabis market at the moment, due to the fact that she's, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, responsible for the inspections, the licensing, and, and so forth. So someone whose insights and, um, and experience and perspective is incredibly important as we look to unpack what the, at least the South African chapter of the cannabis journey uh, has, has looked like. Daphne is a pharmacist with uh, over 20 years experience in various sectors uh, in, uh, in, in the pharmaceutical sector and over 15 years of experience and leadership roles in, uh, in, in management. Her qualifications include a master's in pharmacy and an MBA from uh, Wits University in Joburg. Her responsibilities as, at SAPRA include um, inspecting health products and ensuring that these comply with provisions of the Medicines Act. In terms of cannabis, Daphne is responsible for all matters uh, related to licensing, inspections, issuing of permits for medical cannabis and previously hemp. Um, she's the secretary of the Ministry Ministerial Advisory Committee on Cannabis and the Interministerial Committee on Cannabis. She represents SOPRA and the Department of Health at, the plat at platforms such as the Master Plan on Cannabis, the Presidential's Job uh, Summit at, at NADLIC, and other forums uh, on cannabis uh, across the country. Her other roles outside of work include mentoring professionals, and she has been a, a professional uh, leadership coach for VITS MBA students. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Daphne for the keynote today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, greetings to everyone joining this webinar. I'm excited to be presenting to you. And uh, I would like to start by saying SAPRA exists in terms of the Medicines and Related Substances Act. And the mandate of SAPRA, uh, it pivots around their quality, efficacy, and safety of all health products, including medicines, medical devices that are in the market in South Africa. So please, as I'm giving this note speak, I would like you to take that. We are responsible for ensuring that the public of South Africa re receive quality, safe, and medicines or health products that are of a good standard, high standard in terms of safety and they do what they are meant to do. In terms of cannabis, I would start with uh, international obligations. 
So uh, South Africa is a signatory to the UN and cannabis is classified internationally as a narcotic substance and we are therefore obliged to comply with the single convention on narcotics drugs, uh, the single convention of 1961. So therefore the UN expects signatory members to comply in terms of putting systems in place for control and also we report on consumption in terms of our country's usage on cannabis to the INCB of the United Nations. And then locally, we will recall that in 2018, the Constitutional Court declared that the Medicines Act and the Drugs and Drugs Trafficking Act were unconstitutional in making in cannabis a banned substances and not making it available for private use for private, at a private place by an adult. So we needed to align the Medicines Act and the Drugs Act, which is uh, monitored by the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. So, and Concord gave us 24 months to comply to this. So how did SAPRA then align itself to these requirements by uh, the Concord? So on 22nd May uh, this year, through a process of consultation and as uh, Sid mentioned, the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Cannabis and other uh, consultative forums, including a network. So what we did, we amended the regulations to make sure that uh, we align before the, the Concord uh, effect, the, 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 what was required. So uh, what we did, we approached this through amendment to our schedules. So uh, cannabis was uh, classified under Schedule 7. So in terms of amendment, we therefore amended to do what? Uh, we therefore removed the inscription of cannabis and then we therefore uh, listed THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and then the CBD, with the, which is the cannabidiol. So THC be now becomes a Schedule 6 substance and CBD will be a Schedule 4 substance or Schedule not depending on the specific um, the requirements met. And we therefore, having removed cannabis inscription, meaning that hemp also will become available. Hemp being the low THC, it contain, it will contain in terms of our specification less than 0.2% and therefore it will be regulated by the Department of Agriculture. And it will therefore enable industrialization in terms of making sure that uh, the products relating to cosmetics, food, nutraceuticals, beverages, textile, building material, and all that will be available through the Department of Agriculture because these are non-medicinal products and then they don't need to be regulated through a SAPRA. And remember our mandate is in terms of the Medicines Act and where re the regulation of cannabis now is uh, purely in terms of health product with the medicinal claims and those that are medicinal. So hence, we will enable access in terms of uh, cultivation. We will regulate cultivation because remember THC, we still have to uh, report internationally, it's an international controlled substance. So we will still regulate THC containing product. We will still regulate uh, CBD containing product. So the cultivation of cannabis we will regulate and also uh, manufacturing and export and import of products we will still regulate. Having said this, I just want to, make, to mention that at the moment, government is busy with the National Cannabis Master Plan framework to establish the policy framework that needs to regulate cannabis in the country looking at the pillars of effective regulation that addresses the need of the country, sustainable seed supply system. And uh, this one will be led by the Department of Agriculture, research and development, which will be led by the Department of Science and Innovation, sustainable producer support system also will be led by agriculture, uh, the market development, it will be led by the DTIC and the Small Business Department. 
Supplier development systems will be led by the Department of uh, Trade and Industry and Competition, together also with the Department of uh, uh, Small Business and Manufacturing and Product Development as well. This will lie with the DTIC and the uh, Small Business. Then the other pillar, the eighth pillar, will be the education, communication, together with the capacity development. This will be led by your social development, Department of Education, Department of Communication. And these uh, eight pillars, the, in terms of eff effective um, regulatory system, SAPRA, uh, together with the Justice and Constitutional Development, will be leading this. So I mentioned what SAPRA has done, and then we know that uh, the Department of Justice is responsible for the Drug and Drug uh, Trafficking Act. They have approached it through their amendment to their schedules, but also with the introduction of the cannabis bill that Metal uh, spoke about. So this uh, National Cannabis Master Plan will include the, all the necessary stakeholders because this is a platform that will be able to address cannabis in terms of the needs of the country. I just wanted to say that as SAPRA, our mandate is limited. And as you can all agree that we need to make sure that our products that are going into the public out there needs to be of high standard. When I say high standard, I mean they need to be safe. They need to be quality products and they need to do what they are meant to do. So SAPRA regulates in terms of that. And we, unfortunately, we can't be, go beyond that mandate. Hence, we rely on these other seven pil pillars of the National Master Plan to ensure that this is uh, encompassing. We are South Africans as well, and we would also like and appreciate that cannabis as an industry uh, with the aim of growth and development of this industry and also making sure we contribute to the economic growth, poverty alleviation, and job creation. So together we make sure that we make this work, but at the same time making sure that we do not compromise the, the, the public out there. So that, uh, in short, is what I wanted to contribute. And then I will, I will also be uh, sitting in the panel if there are questions that are meant for me. I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Daphne, thank you so much. That was incredibly informative and uh, we're grateful for your participation and we're looking forward to hearing from you again in a few minutes when our panel starts. Okay, let's get on to that panel. Just a quick housekeeping matter for members of our audience. If you do wish to ask questions, which we encourage you to do, please use the Q&A button rather than the chat button. And then I'll do my best uh, to get to those questions towards the end of the panel. Our moderator for today's panel is Bronwyn Nielsen. Bronwyn is one of Africa's most experienced and respected broadcasters. With over 25 years experience, Bronwyn has been, for example, repeatedly called upon by the World Economic Forum and leading business organizations and institutes, including the African Development Bank and the Africa Business News, to moderate key sessions at their global events. Bronwyn has vast media expertise and a deep understanding of business and finance through both her broadcast experience and insights into the corporate world, having held senior positions with several publicly listed companies. Bronwyn was an executive director, executive director at Africa Business News with responsibility for setting the content agenda for all companies within the ABN group. Bronwyn was the editor-in-chief at CNBC Africa for four years. Uh, and since 2017, Bronwyn currently serves as CEO and founder of Nielsen Media and Associates. Bronwyn, take it away. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. We're going to go straight into our panel discussion, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists. Of course, we're looking at the African cannabis journey, and uh, we're looking at how we are really going to uh, get the industry to develop in these uncertain times so that the continent can unlock the, the health, the development potential, and also the industrial potential of cannabis. So joining me, CBC Sogaba, the CEO of Global Go Africa, co-founder, CEO of Africa Cannabis Advisory Group, and you've met CBC so earlier in the conversation. Joy Olafia, who is a passionate social entrepreneur. She's the co-founder and director of Botanican. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Tseli Khiba, advocate Tseli Khiba, 
from the African Union, and she's the expert committee on cannabis at the African Union. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, we do have Daphne as well, who, if we do know, need to go to that regulatory environment after that very powerful presentation from Daphne Mukhadi Fafudi and uh, of course the amazing opening address by Myrtle Clark. And I want to start right there, so we see some uh, Myrtle saying that we're talking about an industry that is 700 years old. So the African cannabis industry is 700 years old. Um, so let's talk about, and, and I want to jump in with the comparison to South America, because both territories, Africa and South America, claim the uh, best operating conditions um, and the most cost-effective operating conditions for cannabis. Give us the reality. Sure. Thanks so much, Bronwyn. Um, so just to um, provide a bit of context, um, South America has, I think, certainly been, let's say, a few, has, has, has certainly been a few years ahead of uh, Africa in the way of the development of the legal cannabis industry. Um, this is, there's a number of reasons for this, but I think first and foremost is its proximity to North America. Now, the cannabis uh, industry in the way of capital, uh, in the way of uh, in, um, innovation, in the way of a global uh, sort of expansion has been a Canadian and, um, and US story, with Europe being the next sort of chapter in terms of large scale um, uh, growth and, and development. And so South America's traditional his, and historic roots uh, uh, and trading roots with North America um, almost lifted it up uh, in, in unison with, uh, with the development of the industry. Now, um, with, with Africa, our trading routes are much more linked to Europe. And so um, the viewpoint is that Europe is probably about five years behind uh, the um, five years behind North America in the way of uh, the establishment of the sector. And so um, Africa um, is, is also a little bit lagged uh, from that perspective. But we certainly do possess um, many qualities that uh, give us a competitive advantage, particularly in low cost uh, cultivation. Um, and I think one way, as we begin to develop domestic industries uh, and um, allocate resource to, resources towards um, unpacking the um, and understanding the plant, um, we will begin to also um, you know, grow with the development of the local and European cannabis industry. Joy, if I can bring you in here in terms of Africa's need to address the perception issue around product quality and compliance. Um, yeah, with, with our age-old <laughs> industry now being newly regulated, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and um, every action that each company does necessarily influences and impacts the global perception of our industry. And so we really need to collaborate um, it's only through actions and results that we're going to be able to shift um, the perceptions around quality and standards. And so the, the, the environment needs to be enabling for that. So I'm excited to hear about the master plan. I'm excited to hear about the potential. I think that um, with smart regulation and um, an accessible and affordable uh, testing and services, um, then our industry can start to shift the perception um, about what we're producing globally. Certainly much has been made of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement um, in terms of boosting intra-Africa trade, but how is it going to impact the, the cannabis environment? Do you think it's, it's going to give it a real boost? Okay. Thanks, Bronwyn. Basically, the African Free Continental um, Free Trade Agreement can facilitate the growth of the cannabis industry by giving access to a larger market. Um, the free continent free continental um, agreement is estimated to reach a market of about 1.2 billion people, and I believe that there are also other mechanisms within me mechanisms as well as efforts within the AU that further complements the growth of the cannabis industry. And for example, I would like to cite the African Medicines Regulatory um, Harmonization Initiative, and that looks to harmonize the way in which medicines are registered across the continent. So for one, that would ease transportation of the different medicines and the use as well. And I think also what is crucial in the scope is to also look at how cannabis is scheduled across the continent. And you'll find that with a lot of countries, it's based on what is set out in the international treaties, which is obviously up for debate. 
And with that, I think there's also a huge, a huge um, incentive and need to also look at balancing the relationship that people have with cannabis from the commercial side, which the African free continental area would facilitate, but also to balance that with the very old and traditional industry that has persisted for many, many years, as Myrtle said earlier. CBC, so you have moved from the investment banking environment into the entrepreneurial role, uh, Africa Cannabis Advisory Group, and you've traveled extensively. You've investigated the cannabis story globally. So what would you say are the opportunities that entrepreneurs in Africa are not capitalizing on that you've seen in other territories? Sure. So I think in Africa, we've, um, in terms of the let's say, um, the ecosystem of uh, clients and participants that we know, there's, there's, there's certainly a, a strong bias towards viewing cultivation as the cannabis industry. So, you know, probably 70 to 80% of the engagements that we have with clients or prospective clients in Africa are, are stakeholders, entrepreneurs, um, and individuals who, think, who are focused on growing and want to grow and, and see that as the entire industry. But um, with um, you know, with the time that I've spent abroad before starting ACAS, I, I spent about four months traveling around the world doing extensive research on the industry. You realize that there's uh, an entire ecosystem of businesses and services that work around cultivation. Um, and so, for example, in um, you know, in um, Canada, North America. A lot of the capital that's going into cannabis now is going into research and development, and it's going into brands and creating um, and creating a story around, you know, um, with a particular individual community um, and their journey in, in the cannabis world. And so, I think um, in the way of uh, Africa, I do think cultivation is important. I do think it's an for example, beginning to um, tell the story of. A, a particular strain of cannabis or a particular community, um, you know, that has used cannabis to, you know, to um, for economic sustenance and so forth is something that is uh, particularly compelling. Uh, and secondly, thinking about, uh, you know, um, um, the process beyond cultivation. So um, uh, thinking about processing, extraction, formulation, those areas with coupled with our, um, some of our really unique strains allow for, I think, for um, really, really um, strong uh, uh, economic opportunities and opportunities that can have uh, as much of a, let's say, a, a social dividend as a cultivation-focused uh, uh, idea or opportunity. Joy, earlier Myrtle Clark was imploring us not to talk up this industry into a, a fairy tale and that we need to be realistic about the opportunity. And that brings us to the economics of the, the cannabis environment. And if you can just give us a sense of how you talk to supply demand in the broader industry and, and of course pricing, um, because at the end of the day, this has to be a realistic story if it's going to be sustainable. Yeah, and it's tough. I mean, it's certainly not a fairy tale. I think my experience of the last year and a half has been the opposite of that. Um, when we first went and um, so Botanican got our license in late 2019 in, in Lesotho, and at that time the prices were astounding. Um, the, they've since plummeted really quickly, and so we've had to adjust our business strategy. Whereas we were originally planning to do wholesale sales, we've now had to bring forward um, our decision to do branded and white label products, um, which is actually a blessing in disguise because as, as it says, it provides us an opportunity to tell the story of the Harakolo community that grew this first crop and, and the amazing results that we've achieved as a result because of where it, and how it's grown. And so we're extremely proud to be bringing our sun-grown organic medicinal and wellness products from the city to the world. And I think there's an opportunity for the whole of Southern Africa to, to be bringing these amazing products to the global market. Tilly, one of the big problems on the African continent, the different rules and regulations that uh, we find in each territory, and certainly there's a lack of synergy, even if you talk about regional East Africa versus West Africa versus Southern Africa. So if you talk to me now, weigh in from a legal perspective in, in terms of the regulatory framework, 
uh, across the African continent and whether that is conducive to enabling this industry um, to get off its feet in a proper and uh, commercial way. Um, you know, not disregarding the fact that, again, Myrtle said that this is an, a 700-year seven, a established industry across the African continent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, we find that African countries are at different stages, obviously, of development um, economically, and there, there's also unique contexts and approaches to the cannabis industry. So that's why you'll find that Lesotho, which is smaller and, you know, enclosed within South Africa, has been the leader in the cannabis industry on the continent, whereas you find that it, by comparison, South Africa has been a bit slower in the uptake. And that is obviously also due to various factors, economical, economic um, pushes and incentives and um, other regulatory hurdles and challenges. So we find that the context that each African country finds themselves in is quite unique and regulators and policymakers, um, in light of the high stakes involved in the industry do try to approach the industry in a cautious manner and trying to balance the needs of their of their local and domestic environment while complying with the international treaties. However, even in light of those challenges, there are currently efforts across the African Union to harmonize approaches by um, member states. Um, however, these cannot be imposed on member states, but it is hoped that they would form guidelines and um, basically provide an incentive to harmonize and have coordinated approaches that would give access to better resource allocation, better value chains, and um, better coordination. However, the challenge of harmonization, that's across the board. We have it in the United States, where each state has its own you know, legal system. Um, Canada is probably a better example, where at least on a federal level, national level, there's more consistency. And I believe European countries are also battling with the same challenge and are trying to harmonize and coordinate approaches to the cannabis industry as well. So I'm going to put this question to Sibisiso, but uh, Daphne, if you are with us at this time, I, I would love to get a little bit more detail on the, uh, the National Cannabis Master Plan in terms of timing the framework. Joy earlier um, certainly pointed forward to looking forward to, to that framework, and perhaps we can get a little bit more on expected timing. But Sibisiso, uh, while we wait for, for Daphne to enable her camera, COVID-19 is a reality and it is setting many, many industries back. There's a lot of new money flowing into the commercialization of cannabis at this point. Do you think that this is really gonna see a pullback of uh, that money flowing into the plant? Sure, so I, I think COVID is, is quite an interesting one because it's, um, it's had, um, it's, had it's, it's produced both headwinds and tailwinds for the cannabis industry. Um, if you look at um, the response in, in North America, um, what came as a surprise to many, um, you know, many in society was that cannabis in, in legal states and, uh, and I think in, to some degree in Canada was uh, 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 categorized as an essential good. So those, even in, in the midst of the lockdown, those stores were open uh, due to sort of uh, people's medicinal needs for the plant, people's needs for uh, sort of peace of mind through, through quite a, a challenging and turbulent time. And that period saw, saw record sales of, of cannabis uh, in, uh, in, in that part of the world. Um, how, and, and so I think in terms of the, um, let's say, medium to long term, I think that the COVID will, uh, will certainly shift the demand curve of cannabis uh, up. Um, so I think it, it, it will be certainly a, a positive in the way that people think about, um, you know, treating medical conditions, natural medicines and so forth. In the short term, I think that there are uh, some real challenges um, that this has caused, uh, particularly in Africa. Um, we do have a situation now where most of Africa will be in recession, if, if not all of Africa due to COVID and potentially uh, an economic depression. Um, so that means entrepreneurs, corporates, governments um, have had to or will have to relocate uh, or, or reassign budgets towards kind of survival mode and, and, and uh, looking to sort of keep, um, keep afloat, if you will. And so, you know, a lot of the discussions that we are having now with a, a number of stakeholders is around um, how can you um, look to still participate in the cannabis industry, but perhaps um, look to participate, pay, participate at a much lower capital 
initial capital base. So you at least um, are, are, are participating, you are at least um, helping to set up the industry, but you know it might not be these very large scale cannabis um, uh, sort of projects and, um, uh, and, uh, and, in, and initiatives that we've become used to. So starting at a much smaller scale and um, fine tuning business models, uh, private public partnerships at that scale um, and then as and when economies are in a position to to finance cannabis that capital can can become available um, like, Daphne let's get uh, the timelines if it's possible on the the national cannabis master plan that you refer to in your keynote address uh, thank you Branwin the National Cannabis Master Plan is coordinated by the Department of Agriculture. Unfortunately, I can't speak on their behalf, but what I can mention is that uh, at the moment, the consultations are still within government and they are at the moment uh, creating a list of uh, non-government and cannabis uh, interest groups who need to be part of consultative process. And uh, I think they will be communicating that in due course. I don't have the information, but uh, I would advise that in the next webinars, if you can uh, please include the stakeholders that I have mentioned, it would really be helpful because we will be complementing each other in uh, when we are uh, speaking on this. But I know that uh, the Department of Agriculture and the DTIC are working together in this coordination, and this is uh, by instruction of um, Parliament. Thank you very much. We, we can't have a discussion on uh, cannabis and uh, the production uh, lines without talking about climate change, because this is the essence of sustainability in the world at the moment. So I'm going to throw this open to our panelists in, in terms of, of climate change and, and how this is impacting the cannabis African journey. Um, Brandon, sure. I'll um, jump in. Joy, let's hear from Joy and then Sibs will come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just excited because this is my favorite question. Um, I, think <laughs> that, um, I think that the cannabis industry holds huge potential for solving some of the, our greatest problems from social problems and economic problems, but also environmental ones. One hectare of cannabis can um, absorb 22 tons of carbon dioxide, um, which is significantly more effective than a forest. Um, and it also absorbs the toxins that are harmful and other harmful materials from the soils and it prevents soil erosion. So if we do regenerative farming practices, and maybe it's a blessing in disguise that COVID has meant that the capital is going into smaller initiatives. Because if we can do regenerative approaches and do sustainable farming practices, uh, we can really make a, make a shift um, in, in climate change issues. I can't believe our timing. We are almost at five to eight and I'm going to bring Paul Rosen back into the conversation now because I know there's an additional Q&A that we are, are going to take um, from the audience. I see we've got a number of participants, Paul. Uh, lots of questions coming through from a very interactive audience this evening and I know Sibs will probably want to pick, or pick up on his point on climate change um, because it, it looks as though that is stirring up a, a lot of passion. But uh, Paul, I'm going to hand over to you at this point. Thank you so much, Bronwyn, and thank you to our panelists for an incredibly informative and entertaining session. Yeah, we actually have a lot of questions. I think this is the most amount of Q&A Global Go has ever got at a webinar, so I'm going to take that as a very positive sign that one, we have an engaged audience, but two, we're really touching on some really important issues as this industry starts to reach, reach sort of critical scale. There's I'm not gonna have time to get to everybody's questions, so please, if I don't get to your question, feel free to reach out to any one of us on email or LinkedIn. We wanna hear and respond to everything. All right, in no particular order, I'm gonna start with a question from Pierre Vandolf, and sorry if I mispronounced any names here. Specifically, cannabis is legal in many countries. How come these countries, plus many USA states, do not have to comply with the UN single convention and INCB regulations? As a sovereign nation, why does South Africa feel it must comply with these patently outdated rules, otherwise ignored by many countries? Uh, whoever wants to handle that hot potato, 
I will give you the microphone. <laughs> okay, I think I can take that. Um, as I mentioned, we are a signatory to the UN. And remember, whatever policy decision that we are making, it, it needs to be taken at a policy level, it's a, at a country level, and we need to be able to demonstrate that we have systems in place that we will be able to regulate this substance because we are still a signatory. So the UN does not dictate how we must do things, but we need to demonstrate to the UN that as a signatory, how do we comply with international standards and what measures and systems in place do we have to ensure that, because remember, we need to be cognizant of substance abuse. And we know that in South Africa, this uh, uh, is also used as a gateway drug and in terms of uh, social responsibility and also for protecting the public, we also need to put systems in place. If we want to legalize cannabis, it will be a policy decision. And uh, hence I'm saying the master plan with the, the, the eight pillars, they will be looking at such. And hence the participation of all stakeholders that are affected will be so key to ensure that whatever policy that the country comes up with, we will be able to defend it and also be able to demonstrate that it is a good one and it will work for the country. Thanks all. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I'm sure other panelists want to weigh in, but we've got to get to another question because we're running short of time. Um, all right. I have somebody to choose from here. This one is from Peter Mubanda and it relates to money. Uh, money does unfortunately, if not make the world go around, help it spin a little bit. Um, and it's actually for Sib. Sibs, the question of money and cannabis in Africa, could you elaborate on it? Assuming all aspects of the supply chain can be accessed, is there money for the development of these segments from private enterprise or from the banking industry? Or is this still a thing where one keeps looking towards the government for financing? Sure. So um, I will say that uh, capital is, is probably the uh, biggest challenge in the industry right now, especially uh, on the continent. Um, I think where, uh, where Lesotho did exceptionally well uh, in this industry was that they moved uh, very quickly. Um, so sort of 2017, uh, Lesotho um, effectively opened the, the legal cannabis market. Uh, and by, by our estimates, they've attracted over $200 million of foreign direct investment into the cannabis industry. Um, unfortunately, we have gone through a period in, in the industry where um, uh, the, the market has corrected. So if you look at equity um, markets in cannabis, uh, there has been a, a, a sell-off, which we think is a sort of um, as a result of, of uh, what is expected to be a natural evolution of the industry. So some teething issues um, with uh, growth and development. Um, issues around uh, um, regulatory environments and so forth. So um, capital has dried up in general. However, we have seen that um, with uh, our client group and, and uh, um, um, stakeholders that we work with and engage with, capital is available for businesses that um, are exceptionally well um, thought out with strong teams um, that are globally connected because this is uh, the global aspect of it is quite important, uh, at least for this chapter. There will be, I think, more emphasis on local, um, you know, as, as, uh, as legalization sort of rolls out. Um, and one way there is some kind of edge. Um, and I think a good example of this is actually Botanican, which is Joy's uh, company. It stands out uh, versus some of the other businesses in the industry because it is a social enterprise, but one where um, quality execution, um, you know, aspects such as um, you know strategic uh, international partners uh, are being considered on, uh, in the in, in the mix, and that really stands out versus what we see, which is a typically a very you can almost copy paste the, so many of the, the different businesses that come across our desk, and so doing that extra bit of work to um, understand the industry, you know, at a first principles basis formulating, putting together a very strong team uh, and looking for an edge, whether that is in um, uh, sort of IP formulation, building a brand and a story, um, you know, or uh, a very unique strategic partner that could, uh, that could really help you stand out. The capital is there. It's much, much smaller pool, um, but from high net worth and family offices, we, we certainly have uh, a group of, of investors that are looking at the space very seriously. Amazing. Um 
We're near the end of our time, but I'm going to keep going unless someone tells me not to. Um, this relates to the cosmetic industry. So this is another scramble question. Um, if Safra regulates medicines with cannabis, does that mean people who make cosmetics with CBD oil do not need approval from Safra or must they still go through Safra? Maybe either Joy or City, if you feel comfortable with that one, we could hear from you. Otherwise, I will let anyone else figure it out. Okay, in terms of SAPRA, we regulate uh, health products that have got medicinal claims or that contain substances as CBD, as we uh, mentioned that uh, we have specified how we are regulating CBD. But if you're speaking about cosmetics, we will look into the content. So the exceptions that we are making in terms of quantities, there are quantities that we, we exempt and then also the claims that are also made, we also exempt if they are acceptable. So in, in cosmetic, that will be allowed. And, uh, but remember, in terms of uh, the facilities that would manufacture those products, it will depend on how do they acquire the raw material and all that. So they, we do define how uh, we will be regulating that, but we don't regulate cosmetics. That falls under the food stuff and uh, cosmetic Act, which is under the Department of um, Health. So, yeah, but right. we do uh, define how we regulate CBD. For further information, one can contact us out, outside this. Yeah, Daphne, I should say there was a, a remarkable amount of questions about uh, the pillars, uh, about um, uh, just all sorts of areas that you would touched upon the master plan. So I think there's a strong appetite to learn more about the master plan and the pillars, uh, and maybe uh, at a subsequent event we can uh, spend some time unpacking. Um, we're getting near the end of our time, but I still feel that if everyone's okay, we can keep going just a little bit longer. If I'm not taxing anyone's schedule, um, this is a question for either City or Joy. It's a straightforward question. How can people get involved in the industry on a grassroots level to either empower their own communities or even to start making changes in local laws? Um, thank you for that question. I think there are various ways that people can approach that. And I found that activism, particularly within the cannabis industry has been very consistent over the years. Um, it's just that the take up was much slower. So I think it's through activism and through, um, it's through activism, but also through trying to maybe organize um, communities to rather approach the government and representatives in a consistent manner and in an organized manner to basically set out what maybe the demands are. Because we tend to find that, um, say for example, with the countries within the SADC region that have allowed for licenses to be issued and so on. Um, as highlighted also by Joy, that licenses tend to be quite expensive. So then the question would be, how can a community access the license to enable them to deal in um, the industry? And we find that sometimes they may be able to pool and attract investments um, with the right initiative that can appeal to investors. But also, I've also been impressed by other models that are comparative to the cannabis industry in the African context that I believe can also be implemented here, such as allowing programs where these licenses can be paid, can be paid up over time once maybe the community has had something going and has started a commercial venture. But at this point, I think it's also very important to highlight that not everyone is looking to go that route into the industry. Not everyone is in it for a commercial venture. We have many people, even particularly in Lesotho and across the continent, that have been dealing in cannabis in various ways for traditional medicines, for their own personal and private use. And I believe there needs to be a space left for that. And South Africa has made steps to ensure that through their privacy laws. So I do wish that more countries would provide that avenue and margin for the communities as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one more question, which I'm going to direct to Joy. Uh, this is from Alfredo Pasquale. Um, Joy and panel, but specifically Joy, do you think that by prioritizing exports, um, meaning that there's been export-oriented regulations uh, that have been betrayed with 
promises of billions of dollars of uh, exports that could be accomplished. Are you concerned that African countries have so far missed an opportunity of generating robust domestic markets in their uh, focus on export markets? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it makes the most sense for us to meet our domestic market demands. There's a massive domestic dem uh, market. The problem is the regulatory frameworks where in Lesotho, our only markets really that we can access legally are um, through international exports at this stage. Um, and so we eagerly await the change on the laws of the South African um, policy so that, so that we can um, meet the needs of our domestic market, which is massive. Yeah, I totally agree, at least from my perch in Canada. Uh, we have a, you know, we're not a large country. We're only uh, less than around 35 million people, but it's still a robust market for us. Uh, and so I always think you should build your domestic market and then the export market can fill in after that. Um, regrettably, we've run out of our allotted time, which is a shame because we continue to have questions pour in. I've never actually seen uh, such an engaged audience. So first of all, my great appreciation to the audience for being so engaged and asking such a, uh, a range of uh, interesting and important questions, only a few of which I was able to highlight today. But I encourage all interested participants participants to continue to reach out to any of the panelists, our keynote, our moderator, or myself after the webinar. I think you'll find that we're all available and interested in uh, having an exchange of ideas, not so much a Q&A, but an exchange of ideas. We're building this global industry because we really believe that uh, best practices from one jurisdiction are easily uh, migrated to another jurisdiction, and no doubt Africa will have best practices that the rest of the world will want to learn from, and perhaps the rest of the world will have some best practices that will benefit the development of the African industry uh, as it really gets ready to scale up and deliver on its promise. Um, I'm so grateful to all the panelists, uh, to our moderator, uh, and really I want to circle back to that incredibly inspirational message that Myrtle uh, delivered to really set the stage for today. And I think that it's important why we all sometimes get visions of dollar signs in our eyes about what this industry is. This doesn't work unless we really build a socially equitable platform to deliver. So in that whole construct, profits, people, uh, let's put people ahead of profits for this industry. Profits will be there, of course, but planet people and then profits rather than profits ahead of planet and people. I would encourage everybody that found today's webinar useful, helpful, informative to uh, give back a little bit by following the donation link to be able to make a donation to Fields of Green for All. As long as people are imprisoned for doing the very thing that we're celebrating today, we have a problem in our industry. And the best way to improve the future of our industry is to deal with some of the injustices of the past. So I really encourage everybody to lean into that. A little bit of money expressed over a lot of people goes a long way. I'm sure that Myrtle and her colleagues will put that money to extraordinary use. That's it for today. On behalf of Global Go, I am Paul Rosen. Uh, looking forward to our next opportunity to get together and looking forward to watching Africa become one of the paramount and most influential cannabis economies in the world. Thanks so much, everybody, panelists especially. Uh, Godspeed, and we look forward to our next gathering. Bye-bye.